Hi, Peter Kohn. Dr. I Ruth. Hi, how Ruth. are you? Where are you, in Australia or New Zealand? Uh, Australia. Okay. Uh, I'm in Melbourne. Nice, I have been there. And a very good evening to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, in fact, I have very good, uh, very nice memories of our interview in 1989. Okay. Uh, uh, you were visiting Australia and you were I in was, Melbourne. And, and I was also in New Zealand. That's right. And um, at the time, Sam Lipsky was the editor of the Jewish News, who I think you know, uh, and um, we, the two of us, um, had uh, an, our interview over morning tea at the Windsor okay. Hotel. Okay. <laughs> so, so that was a long time ago. And you also, I think you put my book, I'd written a book about my parents uh, in Shanghai during World yes. War II. And you put it into a Jewish library in New York. Um, uh, probably in my... Probably at the Leo Beck Institute. It, it could be. Or it, at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Yes. It, in the bookstore. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Have because you, you know why? An uncle of mine, Uncle Max, went from Germany to Shanghai to San Francisco. That's how I came to New York to visit him mm -hmm. on my way back to Israel. And look what happened. <laughs> so that was the trigger that got you from yeah. Israel to the US. And ca can I ask you, have you been back to Australia since 1989? No. 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 Yeah. No. But who knows? Maybe another time I will come. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's hope it, the situation gets back to normal and you can make it here. What a, I... what a terrific thing that would be. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a few questions for you. And uh, the first one concerns uh, the Me Too movement. And um, I'd like to get your views on how has the Me Too movement affected uh, sexual relations between um, women and men? What's your view? Okay, first of all, you're going to be disappointed because I don't talk about politics. However, I do say, did you see the documentary, Ask Dr. Ruth? on Hulu, try to see it. Because yeah. my granddaughter says, what, what do you mean you are a feminist? I said, no, I don't want you to go out and burn brass. However, I do believe in equal rights. And I do, I'm very saddened about what has happened right now that you, Peter, can't even tell me anymore that you like my blouse or I'm going to plug a book, Heavenly Sex, Sexuality in the Jewish Tradition. Can you see it? Yes. That just became a, a classic at NYU Press. Will never be out of print. And, and so I just want to prove to you, I'm just old fashioned and a square. I want you to be able to say, Dr. Ruth, you look lovely. You're going to be 93 on June 4th. You did a beautiful documentary. Right now, the Jewish actress Toba Felchu is going to play me in the play Becoming Dr. Ruth. And I, I, I don't want to get into all of the politics, but I'm saddened that it has become such a political football that you, Peter, watch out. You're a good looking guy. You can't tell any other journalist you're wearing a nice dress. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think uh, feminism has impacted Judaism specifically and particularly the more traditional Judaism? I, I think that the most important thing now that I'm getting an honorary doctorate, as you know, yes. from Ben Gurion University, and I have raised over hundred thousand dollars for a scholarship in psychology, and that scholarship is also going to be given to some Bedouin. So what I want to say is, all of this talk 
about what you can say. And I'm not talking about rape. Anybody who has been raped has to look for professional help, period. I'm talking about innocent. How often have you, Peter, with that mustache of yours, how often have you said to a woman, uh, you look nice today? You can say that to me. I'm 92, almost well, 93. You, you do look lovely today. Thank you. So I'm very worried. I'm not talking about the ones where force is used. I'm talking about one of, it's difficult for men to know now where the borders are. Can you tell a woman, can we have a cup of coffee? In my way of thinking, yes. Can you tell her, come to my hotel room? In my opinion, no. And in my opinion, to her, I say, you have no business in this good looking guy's bedroom in the hotel, even at a convention. So, but I'm not going really gang ho on that Me Too movement. I hope it'll pass. People will have to learn something from it. No woman should be in a man who is not her boyfriend. I'm not even talking about husband. I will uh, uh, put herself into a position where he gets sexually aroused because that sexual arousal, you know that, you don't need me to tell you that it's a very strong arousal. And then some people lose their thoughts, they lose their heads. So tell me a bit more about the honorary doctorate from Ben Gurion University and the $100,000 endowment for the scholarship for psychiatry. Psychology. Psychology, sorry. Uh, I'm jumping for Joyce because 1948, I was in Jerusalem and when Ben Gurion declared Israel, I was dancing on a truck the whole night. I have never met him too bad because now that I'm Dr. Ruth, I would have loved to meet him. He was short. He was pretty good looking. He did yoga. I have an autobiography uh, and not an auto, a biography of him where there's a picture of him standing on his head. And I know that he had some girlfriends because I find out, of course. And for me to get the Ben Gurion Honorary doctorate, it's my first honorary doctor in Israel. I have a few in this country. It's making me jump for joy. And that I raised enough money, $130,000 for the scholarship in psychology. And that they told me they have now 20% of uh, Bedouin women. Very important for me because when I was in the orphanage in Switzerland, yeah. I wanted so badly to go to the local high school and they did not let girls go. I don't have a high school diploma. Don't tell anybody. Now I'm getting another honorary doctorate. So for me to have a, doc, uh, a scholarship in my name at Ben Gurion University, I hope you tune in April 28th, my time, hold it. I want to make sure that I, it's a Sunday, one o'clock my time. And yeah. the, the president of Ben Gurion University specially flew to New York to interview me. So it's all going to be on Zoom. Now, uh, you were actually, when you were in Israel, you were actually on the day of independence, you went from your air raid shelter to find a book uh, because I was I was looking back at your biography. This one, yes. And I tell you, you what, you, you 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 it saved your life literally because you went you weren't there when the bomb hit. Two. On the one hand, it was on my birthday. I did go to the room saying I'm not going to waste time sitting in a shelter. On the other hand, it was stupid because the alarm sounded, I should have gone to the shelter right away. When I came back down into the lobby, the pagas, the cannonball hit, 
killed some girls next to me, wounded me very badly. Luckily, there was a German Jewish surgeon. Too bad he's not alive anymore. I would carry him on a silver tray who fixed me beautifully. I, I was a very good skier. That's how I met husband number three. Yep. And, and I skied until late in life, not anymore. So um, I, I can dance a whole night. If I find a good looking guy like you, I could still dance a little bit, but not a whole night. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. don't say that I belong to those women who don't like to make a compliment to a good looking guy. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and um, I'm, I'm really flattered that you have. Thank you. <laughs> um, turning to uh, something that you said in your book, um, you, you compared yourself to that little German doll, the Stehaufmännchen, which is the little doll that no matter how many times you sit it down, it springs up again. And resilience has been your key word in your life, yes. your philosophy. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes. I tell you what, I have that doll here. I don't want to waste Zoom time to get it. But right now, Tova Felchu is going to play me in the theater in Becoming Dr. Ruth. And I showed her that doll. And what it really showed is resilience. That when you get knocked down, when you lose a job, mourn five minutes and go out and look for another one. And what I did in my life, that's the resilience that I, when something did not work, when I missed an exam, I was sad. And then I picked up like that doll. When you push that doll down, it jumps right back up. And so resilience is really, should be my middle name. <laughs> and tell me a bit more about that wedding in 2014. It was the Jewish wedding of the great grandson of uh, the man who rescued you from Nazi Germany. And uh, tell me a bit about that. It was his, um, his great grandson's uh, Orthodox Jewish wedding in New York. I mean, oh, I know who you mean. Rabbi Goldsmith, you are right. Rabbi Goldsmith is a rabbi at the synagogue, the Orthodox synagogue on the east side of Manhattan, 64th Street. Uh, I'm blocking on the name, but we'll get it. We'll get it before we end. So um, Rabbi Goldsmith's grandmother was Swiss and she went to the Nazis at the time and said the Swiss will take 300 Jewish children in a kinder transport into Switzerland so that the parents, like my father was already in a labor camp. There, were no, there was no Auschwitz yet. And the labor camp, uh, so that the parents, he, he, he had written a postcard. I must join that group so that he can come back from the labor camp to Frankfurt. They hoped that then people like my father could find a place to go. That did not happen. But what did happen is I was in that group. I didn't want to leave Frankfurt, but I was in that group. And when I saw the postcard of my father from labor camp, I knew I had to go. That saved my life. Mm -hmm. So my parents actually gave me life twice. Once I was born and once when they sent me on the kinder transport. But you know what, Peter? If I had been on the transport to Holland, Belgium, or France, I wouldn't be alive. England took 10,000 Jewish children, despite the fact that there were dark clouds on the horizon. Holland, Belgium, France, and Switzerland, 300. And that Mrs. Goldsmith was courageous. She was Swiss. But she went to the Gestapo and she said, Switzerland is willing to take 300 children. And I was one of those. So I was at his wedding, you're right. And not only that, I see him very often when I go to Stracco, before the virus. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, uh, much closer to this part of the world, Papua New Guinea, and I believe you did some research on uh, the Trobriand Islanders of Papua yes, New did. Guinea. Did, how do you know that? Oh, well, it's out there. It's on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Papua New Guinea, that program, that was wonderful. I took two Israelis, a filmmaker and a producer, and I had a great time being carried in the arms of one of the islanders, a good looking, not as good looking as you, but a good looking guy who took me in his arms to the boat and back from the boat to the shore. And I talked about sex and the National Geographic was supposed to uh, take that film, they never did. Papua New Guinea, it was wonderful. <laughs> and um, you're, of course, going to be speaking uh, for the United Israel Appeal um, yes. online uh, yes. next month. Um, and and I, hope, I hope that they're going to raise a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, without giving too much away, just quickly, what's, uh, wh what can we expect? What will be your message to okay. Jewish women in Australia? My message is that everybody, women and men, have to be sexually literate. That there is no justification for a girl not to know what menstruation is all about, because girls now menstruate at an earlier and earlier age. For a boy and a girl to know about nocturnal emission, for older people, I did a book called Sex Over 50, to know that they can continue to be sexually active if they are smart, not at night, but in the morning, when it's easier for the men to obtain and maintain an erection, that the woman has to use a lubricant. I'd be very explicit because that's, I'm a sex therapist, I can do that. <laughs> so I'm going to say, some of the things of the need for sexual literacy. I'm also going to tell them, I hope they'll ask me or remind me, if not, you do. <clears throat> Sigmund Freud was sexually ignorant. He should have taken a course with me. Sigmund Freud said, any woman who needs clitoral stimulation in order, I want to see if you blush, any woman who needs clitoral stimulation in order to obtain, to have an orgasm is an immature woman. Nonsense. All women, the clitoris is always involved. He did a tremendous disservice. I've had lots of women come to my office in those days when I did sex therapy, saying they don't let their partners touch the clitoris because of Freud. So I'm going to talk about the need even in Australia and New Zealand for sexual literacy. Well, that's, that's great. And um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to being in the audience uh, that day and um, covering that event. Um, Peter, do me a favor. They're going to collect questions, ask a question, okay? And say there that you are Peter Korn and then I talk to you. <laughs> okay, I will do that. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing you um, on the day next month um, when we when we do this. So thank you so much for for. And then afterwards, you make sure that I get what you write. Yeah, absolutely. I will. I will make sure that that happens. Thank you. Uh, well, it was it was it was so great to catch up and to um, to catch up after all these years, and uh, um, a, a real pleasure to talk to you, Doctor. Thank you. You did your homework. Bravo. Always try to do that. <laughs> Thank all you. The best. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Good evening. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs>